to yesterday. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I'm really grateful to, to Joanne for first just her presence in this world and the work that she does, her passion for poetry, um, her passion for art. Um, there's absolutely no question. I, I will say this publicly now, but if she calls and says she wants something done, I'm, I can't say no. I'm hard pressed to say no. That's just the straight up truth. Um, I became involved in Cave Canem at a time when she was at the heart of the work of Cave Canem, and I'm sure she was involved. If she had said, don't get this guy, I would not be there. But, but really, um, a dear friend and somebody who I respect greatly, so it's, it's wonderful to be, to be able to, to be here. And of course, Lauren, who we go back a ways, um, it's great that she's here. I thought, what a perfect combination of two beautiful, powerful women. I thought this will work out well, and man has it worked out well. I'm, I'm so glad, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so it's good, it's good to be here, good to, to see you all. Um, I, I, just to give you some sense of how we're going to do this, um, I'm going to introduce you a bit to this project that, we, that Matthew and I put together, Matthew Shinoda. Um, I'll read, then I will, then I'll ask Matthew to come and read some of the poems and then I will, I will wrap up by reading some of the poems and we'll just go back and forth that way. Um, I, I thought, I thought it important, I think, what Joanne said earlier about, about Bearden. Um, Derek Walcott actually says it in his introduction that he represents clearly uh, one of the great American artists of all time, first of all, and certainly for the 20th century. Um, and what is beautiful about his work is writers love his work. This is the number of books <laughs> that have, and people will use the same piece of art on different books, right? And you will go, well, I can't use that cover because somebody used it. I'm using it anyway. I'm using that piece of art anyway. There's a real sense in which Bearden understood narrative, the image and the function of narrative and how narrative works and, and he also understood 
the iconic moment of the image. He really gets that. But what is most impressive about him is the clear, meticulous craft. There's something about staying far and going closer, and the closer you get, the more amazed you get by the care that this artist uses to put together this work. It's fascinating work. And, um, and it, it impacts, as all great art does, it impacts people of all ages, all experiences, and so on. It, it has a way of, of moving you. So we, we, this, the story of how this came about, um, some years ago, um, I met, um, met a man called, <laughs> I, I will call him Mr. Goins, um, uh, and he, is a, he was a friend of Romer Bearden um, and a collector of, of Bearden's art and so on. I, met, I visited him at, um, in, in New York one day and he says, uh, you know, come to my place. And of course, he had all this art in the place, right? Um, but it's scary kind of art because, you know, you see, you see all these major African-American paintings sort of leaning on the wall and just <laughs> all over that. And I'm going, this is like the real thing, right? All these big names and so on. And then, of course, Bearden's work is there. Um, and so we were talking and he said, you know, I wanted to do something with this and so on. And I said, well, you know, I could do something with this because this is, this is too good, right? Um, and so he said, well, what, you do, what would you do? And I said, well, why don't we do, do a book where poets respond to the art? Um, he said, well, we tried that, didn't work. I said, you're talking to me. I mean, like, I don't, <laughs> I, anybody who knows me, like, I don't make suggestions, like, lightly. Like, if I'm going to do it, it will happen. Um, so he says, okay, I'll give it a shot and so on. So, so that's how it began. I contacted Matthew, who is a great friend. We've collaborated on so many things. We continue to. And I'll confess, Matthew gets it done fast and efficiently. You can depend on Matthew Shinoda for that. And I said, you want to co-edit this, this book with me? What's the idea? I said, Bearden's work, and we're just going to get the best poets to respond to it, West African-American poets. There was a little debate with some other people. Should we just you know, make it more universal? And all? I said, no. This one, I want the great poets to respond to, the great black poets to respond to this man's art because it's that intimate to us. It's that special to us. How long did it take? Like in three weeks, right? We just sent out the call, wrote to all these poets we know, all these names, and as soon as they got the email, yep, I'm in, yep, I'm in. But in three weeks, we had our 40 odd poets already settled. And I'm talking about if you look at the list and you know anything about poetry in America, these are the people, right? Um, now people are upset with us because they weren't called. But we, you know, we said, well, don't be upset. Um, we, we'll do another issue, another edition, which we won't do. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a way of saying it. So, so, so the great excitement was getting all of these poets responding with such energy and such passion and making completely new poems. They were writing completely new poems in response to Bearden's work. We had a selection of, of, of the images that we sent around and all of this was done of course digitally online and they drew it down and they pulled out their work, looked at it, wrote their poems and they are just stunning and beautiful poems. And each of these poets speak about their relationship with Bearden's work, how it transformed them, how it affected their lives and so on. Um, so, so then the question, then we decided to find a publisher, um, which was obviously easy because we knew what we had. Um, if you've got Kominyaka and Rita Dove and Terence Hayes and, you know, you know um, Tracy K. Smith, if you've got all of these people there, only an idiot <laughs> is going to say, I'm not publishing it, right, really. Um, but we decided to go with Northwestern because we had developed a relationship with a remarkable African-American editor, Parnisha Jones. And, you know, we said, Parnisha, we want to do this. She says, what? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, and that's, that's how this has come about. And we, this is a stunning book. You should have it. It's a collector's item. Frankly, even if we didn't, we didn't get to publish the actual paintings in the book, just the collection of African-American poets 
of the, the late 20th and 21st century is a remarkable gathering. It's really, really, it's the, the closest thing you get to the gathering is what happens at Furious Flower, right? At Furious Flower here, every, every decade or so, where all of these really important voices walk in and say, we're part of this conversation. So it's very exciting and we're very pleased about uh, what we have here. Um, and there was back and forth. We didn't just, you know, this is an editorial experience. And um, I appreciate the generosity of these poets but, and their openness for feedback, back and forth, and editorial work and so on. So this is, this is just uh, exciting work that we did. Um, a couple of things, though. I, I want to just speak briefly about Derek Walcott's involvement in this project. Um, when we were putting this thing together, Walcott Walcott, who lived, lived, lived in St. Lucia, and he was living in St. Lucia at the time, um, was, was, not as, was not as vibrant and healthy as, as, as in the past, and he hadn't been traveling much. Um, and so the question, when I, I, I thought we would love to get him to do the forward or an introduction for it. Um, and I know Derek Walcott, but I approach him with deep reverence and, um, and care, because Walcott, uh, suffers fools very, very lightly. He doesn't have a lot of time for, for fools. And you're not sure whether you're a fool one day or the other. So that's, that's always a problem. If you know you're a fool, then it's all right. But if you think you're bright, sometimes you have to like, decide, how am I coming? So, but anyway, I approached him, and he said, sure, he'll do it. But he says, um, I'm not writing. So I said, OK, I have a plan, because I had a plan. So I said, why don't I interview you on the phone and then I'll send you the transcript as an essay, and you sign off on it and so on. He says, okay, let's do it. And so that's how we did it. We talked on the phone, I recorded it, transcribed it, sent him the essay, he sent it back saying, this is fine, let's go with it. And in it he makes this wonderful, he shows this insight. He, he'd worked with Bearden, he had, he, had, he had been a good friend of Bearden, they'd spent time in the Caribbean together. Walcott himself is a, a remarkable, uh, very, very gifted uh, watercolorist, and, and all his books really have his work on the cover. Um, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people know that because who goes searching for that information? Um, but he, he has this great affection for Bearden and a tremendous respect for Bearden. So his introduction was just a fantastic thing for us to be able to have uh, as, as part of, as part of um, the collection. Um, so, so I think what we have here is a, is, is a monument, is a monument, and we, we as writers understand that sometimes monuments are built from clay and they are put up, um, some, some pleasing, some affirming, and some offensive, uh, and that what we as writers have to do is build these monuments of language. What artists have to do is build these monuments of their art that remind us of the narrative. And the narrative in the Odyssey for Bearden was that he was taking a narrative, an old mythic narrative, and then imposing upon that the, 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 the narrative of the African and the African in diaspora, the African who has been forced from one place to the other. And he saw in the narrative of Odysseus, the narrative of the, the heroic narrative of African men and women, um, in their journey to the new world and in their journey into a point of survival through the tragedy of, of this great middle passage. And that's the beauty that, that Bearden achieves here. And so, in a sense, his art is a monument to that memory and to that history. And these poems become their own monument to that history. Um, and to me, that's one of the most uh, fascinating things in it. The other thing that pleases us is our care to make sure that the voices of, of, of women are fully like represented here. Not a hard thing to do because, to be honest with you, the women are pretty much kicking ass. Like they're just dominating in terms of the work, and you you can tell, um, which is which is which is useful uh, for poets like me. Um, I, I'm a guy um, to a, a male. Uh, the, I am. It turns out, but it. But, but it's, it's, it's a great challenge. It's a necessary challenge because in the Caribbean and in African poetry and African-American poetry, the emergence of these women's voices has transformed the entire poetic agenda and the work that we do. So one of the beauties of this collection is that it shows you that in, in beautiful ways. 
So what I'll do is I'll stop here. Matthew will come and read a few poems, and then I'll come back and read a few of the poems from the collection. We'll take some questions, and then that'll, that'll be it. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne and Lauren and Karen and all of the Furious Flower folks. Um, you know, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this. I think Kwame framed it. I, I want to just um, dive into some of these poems so you can hear a bit of this work. Um, and the one thing I will say, as, as Kwame had mentioned, is when we put the call out, these are all fairly well accomplished, and in some cases extremely well accomplished, um, busy people, serious writers, and the way that people responded so immediately and so intimately to the call is not a testament to Kwame and I, it's a testament to Romare Bearden. The, the, the way that they immediately said, I want to be a part of this. There was a very communal sense to this, which I think reaffirmed our decision that we would keep the call for the poets for this particular project um, focused on the African diaspora and, and the ways, as you will see, that, that folks responded to the work, sometimes to individual pieces and sometimes to the work of Beard and writ large was, was quite stunning. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem called Cove Song from the poet Camille Dungy. Um, and this piece was written specifically in response to Bearden's piece, Siren Song, which is in the book as well. Cove Song by Camille T. Dungy. One and two and three in time, white birds hum out of the choir of air while we tend our dark skin with coconut oil, content to sing a welcome to the high and low tides. The sky song is a blues the sea comes into on repeated lines. Why, even the rocks sing and the reeds. This is how we learn what game to lure into what traps, which scales to seek, which to keep at bay. We've heard the mess those men have said, that all we do is stand around and chatter. It drives them mad, our simple acts, repeated for the pure pleasure of sound. We've taught the flowers, high and yellow, how to modulate their tone. They used to come off sharp and off beat, but now they blend right in. The men think themselves industrious, sword thrusting, sea sailing, the purposes of their purpose-driven lives. It makes them crazy to think we do nothing more than play the lyre, sing all day, like a group of grade school boys trounced in debate. They plug their ears and turn away. Only one climbed the lookout to listen. Does he hear? Even the boulder's jaws are wide. Even the canoe's mouth joins our song. The cloud is singing softly. Listen now. Her voice will blend with the wind with rain. This is a piece called The Taste of the Lotus, London, January 4th, 2013, by the poet Honoree Fanon Jeffers, after Bearden's Land of the Lotus Eaters, and it begins with an epigraph from Idrissa. Darling, at first, we did not know why the white men came for our brothers, and by the time we found out, it was too late. Idrissa. It was an outlander's honeymoon. London, at Christmas, failed to impress my African Muslim husband. A trip to the slave trade exhibit at the museum didn't change his mind. I was outnumbered in a house with three Senegalese, an Ivorian, and a hostile polyglot toddler. I debated in whispers, afraid to wake the diaspora. 
Stop making your excuses for those Africans, I said. They certainly did know what slavery was about. Yet I'd fallen in love with Senegal, a country brutally dear. The sea sought to drag me down one day. I had to run away from the water, find the inconstancy of sand. No, we didn't know, my husband told me, at first angry, then patiently convinced. And anyway, it's not those Africans anymore. It's us Africans, because now you are my wife. In London, I'd chop onions for my inferior jollof rice, and then a memory of just torn mangoes bought from ladies on the road north to Dakar, that candied funk I craved, bananas shamelessly cheap, Milky sap of the baobab, addictive in the glass. Which one of these tasted of the lotus, that mythological, apathetic fruit? Pacified African traders as they waved goodbye to the ships and their close-packed murmuring kin. Please do. Three Thirsty Souls by Yusuf Kumanyaka. Sometimes a man goes inside himself and rises in a damp, sunny new land. Larry, is this how you arrived from Trenton Saturday mornings to sit in a Harlem library with Ralph, Romare, and Albert, vamping on ancient stories on color wheels and Webster's down-home jazz and blues tonalities, folk and cosmopolitan plates of scat, everything African from food to death. I envy those times now gone to dust and easy fame, the old school voyaged from catfish to in, <clears throat> to in the know. Larry, we sit here tracing Romare from 401 South Graham Street in Charlotte to Pittsburgh, Harlem, and St. Martin, crossing tributaries of country and blood, from lovers to a walk in Paradise Gardens, from Conjure Woman to Carolina Shout, and then home to Ithaca. A place in the mind lives in the body, but they say no man is an island, even if exiled in his weary bones, returning with totem flag and insignia from an underworld of men pig-headed, braced by a shield and a javelin, Odysseus easy into the harbor, but he doesn't look like a seer or beggar, driven by omens or a beckoing bow. The raw, breathing sound of a conch made the seagulls fly away as time washed over a Mediterranean green, and now water can be heard lapping against the sighing wooden hull, the sails blown open by a salty wind. It's Yusuf Kumanyaka. This is a piece called Tubman, um, written after Harriet Tubman. In the original call that we sent to poets, there was a sketch that, that some know who know Bearden's work, work, but he had done this sketch of Harriet Tubman um, sitting on a stool with her gun. It's called Harriet Tubman with a Gun. And this poem is called Tubman by E. Ethelbert Miller, and it begins with an epigraph from Amiri Baraka, Arm Yourself or harm yourself, Amiri Baraka, Tubman. Short woman with a gun leading me through woods, footprints left beside rivers. Freedom is a powerful thing. Sometimes you have to hold it in your hands and listen for the click. And I'll read just Two more pieces here. Stricture by Crystal Ann Williams after Romare Bearden's Conjure Woman. Through the live, love, laugh shop window, I sometimes watch Stella's gnarl of a body shamble up the block, hunched back, black, strict bruja, angry white hair and coal-lined eyes swathed in teal, orange and white. Her smoke trained against gods and devils are imperceptible offenses dragging her bag of skulls and heather, crows circling and cawing like sorcerers overhead. 
Her voice was the first real knowing I had, that among us something is terribly wrong. Her cursing and screech, soundtrack, that snarl and howl, eating up everything in Greek town, leaves and lamb and sweet syrup baklava. For some unspoken reason, she wasn't shuttled off, and I wondered the things we wonder about strangeness, the foreign body how it was when she bathed or slept or danced from whence it came and at night to which it went. It's my fault, really. Had I been tending to matters, live, love, laugh, I would have missed her raging that day, how it happily smacked their laughter to a cold stop, the girl dropping her pastry, father yanking son, the four legs flung to flee, the small sane glint and grin of it, how she examined me, black irises soft and speaking a new language, which opened in me something which I still cannot name. When she nodded and smirked, I nodded back. In my hand is the moment, a twenty-year-old seed, which I roll and roll and worry, wondering what was that language, and well, will it, when will it brutally bloom in me? Black bruja, has it already bloomed in me? And I'll, I'll finish up with this poem here, and then Kwame will share a few more. Um, this is a poem that I wrote for the anthology called Coastal, and I, I wrote this after Beard and Siren Song. Coastal, one. The interest is in the pull of desire, the way a pelican hovers for a moment before her dive, a rush of wind and then the plunge. In the paragon waters, sunlit sustenance in the glossy scales and the gray yearning, an instance of music and the silent reverberations of the seal's paddle. Risen again, belly full to sail the sky above this ocean, if only men could understand this ease to resist their currency in the murkiness of water, wear their calico with loose understanding. Two, every wind that enters this coast is a moment for want, to redefine itself and make its home with lingering. And on the shore the women sing praise and lament, pray the tide will bury the empty-bellied vessel to make their bows a home for sharks and plankton to pull ashore the hulls of flesh and blood, rest them weary by the cook pot, nourish them to remember their names. They call to the pelican above to steer the mast of forgotten horizons, to lead these mate lots to a home of their own, a place perhaps just soft enough that they will discover a love, however small, to keep them from stealing another's. Thank you. Um, so I'll read, I'll read a, few, a few of these poems. Like I said, these are all stunning poems. And um, we've got Patricia Smith, Sharon Strange, Natasha Trethaway, Adrian Mechka, Nate Mackey. I mean, it just goes on. These are just uh, a stunning list of poets. So obviously, can't read all of them. Um, but I thought I'd read a few. Uh, I want to read. Rita Dove's poem, Conjure, largely because um, I was a little surprised by it. And she wrote back, she, when she sent it, she says, uh, I'm a little surprised by this poem, she said. Um, and it's called Conjure, Rita Dove. So many things we traffic in without knowing how, not to mention why, forget why for now, the trick is to concentrate sideways, off sight, so to speak, sliding your eye as far as it will go in order to glimpse the thief escaping on silken legs. Text, Twitter, copy, share, all in a day's busy work, the long glazed frenzy, and before you can turn around, it's vanished, poof, time's up. Who saw that skull coming? Which bird, black or white? Ditto the snake. What creamy rope did he slide it on? This is some serious shit. No time for monkey thumbs. OMG, 
you'll never guess what happened to me, as if life was a series of never mind, skipping stones downstream, a hopscotch from one wiki square to the next. See that lady in the clown suit just outside your field of vision, watching from the forest green's edge, delete, reboot, don't look, the clouds still there. That's <laughs> So that's, that's not your classic Rita Dove poem, but I love it. It's a great, great, great poem. I thought I'd read a poem from Chris Abani, Nigerian poet, uh, who's, of course, been living in the States for a while. There's a longer poem in here which I intended to read, but I think I'll read a shorter one called Homily. What does it mean, an ordinary life, as if there can be a lesson in the fall of browning leaves? But I'm dreaming. What can it mean to feel that only a crow on a wire can understand me? Somewhere out there, a woman grinds cornmeal, a monk taps sand into another mandala, the grain of puzzle, the rub of mystery, testament. Already the word is a betrayal, an incandescence replaced by a matchbook. A kid stiff in khakis told me about war. There's no legend to it, he said, no journey. You just pull the hammer back and casually metal shrugs against metal and you shoot another man in the sand. Poetry is the husbandry of memory. Yet one to attempt a feast in the future, a fingerprint trace. To say good morning is such a sweet torture as my fingers hover over a phone. Outside, I make toast, each bite vengeful, each knife scrape of butter deliberate, to sink my fingers into the wet earth, root around the slip of worms, dig turnover clods. I learn soon enough that every flower bed is a grave, every ripe tomato, the pendulous weight of death. Water, I hope, will save us. Yeah. Sabani. Uh, this is a poem by Elizabeth Alexander, um, and it's from Omni Albert Murray. She wrote a series of poems in response to Albert Murray's work, and then this poem is called Bearden at Work. And there's an epigraph from Bearden. Regardless of how good you might be at whatever else you did, you also had to get with the music. Isn't that great? No matter how good you have been, at, you might be at whatever else you did, you also had to get with the music. Bearden. Paper cotton rhythm, snips of blue foil fa falling onto water-colored paper, colored people into place. I, divines, arrangement, hand slide shifting paper shapes, panes of color learned from stained glass windows, pauses, spacing, Rests from Father Hines. Odysseus is blue. He can't get home. In Bearden's plains, collage on board, shellac. Watch Dorothy children enter us. Look, Daddy, color. No more white and black. This is the year of the color TV. Odysseus is blue and now is black. New York City at Christmas time, Christmas tree shapes like Bearden in a Bearden blue, tin stars falling on a yellow paper trumpet, blue sucked in, blues blown back out, black folks on ice skates shine like Christmas trees, New York glitters like a new idea. Yeah. And this is from a poet called Cyrus Cassell's, a poet that a lot more people should read. I think Cyrus is, is just a gifted, fine eye for a poet. And this is a poem called A Siren Patch of Indigo. Listen, though we swell as rampant woodland or riverbank blossoms, Baptista Australis, in your tensile world, as commonplace beauty and reachable remedy, a soothing eye wash for the Osage, hardy dye for the Cherokee, quiet 
as it's kept, we're more akin to clearing and hillside, way showers, offhand griots, quietly reminding you the punishing rose, the grim night world of the Middle Passage was never your true province. Even in appalling chains, the light of your integrity, your inmost wonder still encircled you, resolute, inviolate. Always recall dear progeny of Sea Island slaves in galling dearth or in Juneteenth glory. Our deep, annealing, sacramental blue belongs to you. Yeah. That's a nice stuff. And this is uh, from the poet Arcelis Germay. Uh, just, I mean, if you've read her latest book, um, Black Mariah, Maria or Mariah, uh, she's just, just a splendid poet, great voice, and so on. So this poem is called Circe to Her Mother. Misunderstood. What I was trying to reach was you where I was raised, always the long dash of horse hair hanging from the wall to swat flies, frankincense burning in the coffee room, boon. Back home, we lived with the animals, but the grayness of their eyes in death, not just their lives, it was love for home and for you, mother who caused me this sorcery. Before marriage, there were some horses I knew and hills. I did not want to go from there, from where we were two-headed once, and then the great wound of birth and an eye by which my seeing is forever read. I wanted you to, mother, never let me free. I am home again. If I lay on my side beside the sleeping wolves, once men, how like the hills of my childhood, white with snow and brown with the names of trees, como te lo puedo decir, leaving was full of salt, was not my verb. Now I cannot bear a kingdom of free things after Circe's domain. I. Yeah. So the great cheat of this exercise is that you get to, to, to get really amazing poets that you admire to send work. And one of the great pleasures for me was Marilyn Nelson um, sending some work for this project. And uh, I'll read a poem by Marilyn Nelson, um, who we'll, we'll, we'll continue to pay attention to for her work with children, and of course her poetry is um, sublime. This is a poem called Among the Lotus Eaters. An archipelago of atolls, rings of coral interfacing sea and sky, protective reef, deep pass, shallow lagoon, around the motu, hundreds of hues of blue, maidens, hundreds of hues of brown offered trays of their food, a flower called lotus their, that satisfies yet increases hunger. I sat down asked myself why I should starve. Eating a lotus flower, I knew my wife had found another. My children were tall, parents themselves, perhaps my parents gone to illness or forgetfulness or dust. Must I go home? What is home anyway? Should I consider one spot of green earth more mine than all the rest of the planet? Why not declare here home? and take a swim. Breathing the frangipani fragranced air, I feasted on lotus and understood how ant-like are the lives of humankind, how comic the havoc fixes we invest, invent to circumvent fate and the natural law. Did Troy's fall make a nebula tremble? Which of the seas was once Achilles' tears, whose children will recall my odyssey. Stay or return, what difference will it make? In the long run, metaphysophalon between now and the looking back future. 
If I stay here feeling all human pain through the god-eyed poetry of Lotus, or if, damn you, Odysseus, you drag me from the Lotus Eater's distance wisdom back to the sweat and spray of minute life. Yeah. So I'll end, thank you, good. So I thought I'd end with a poem from Afa Weaver, um, a, a, an elder, <laughs> elder poet, and somebody who um, I've come to admire, respect, and, and value. This poem is called Milton Avenue Cyclops. It came down to this, that everything went to his head up from the corner where the lights mixed with broken emissions, from stars to the glitter that made in the cement, up between his ears where silence sleeps with the dead until it became some magnificent golden wax like the ark of our covenant with this land we made but is breaking us. Come with me and find my child, my lost son, is what his mama says when she gets wild sparks in her eyes like sh the folks in the insane asylum we called Crownsville. And he was gone, but not gone, found, but not lost, all lit up from way down below where his feet made a peace woven between hallelujahs and amens. The end of our need for back talk and churches. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. If I'm familiar with Walcott's dramatic work, a little. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I've seen his plays, yeah, I've seen some. I've been in some. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys are theater people. Oh, yeah. My people. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm actually teaching pantomime right now. Um, no, I know all of Walker's work, and I think, I think, I, I was telling my students the other day that what is interesting about Walcott is there's the poet and then there's the, 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 the playwright. And um, it's a fascinating arrangement because as a lyric poet, Walcott, when you think of how he handles issues of race and so on, it's very tortured, very sort of conflicted and never clear, never settled. Whereas in his plays, there's a kind of direct articulation of it in Dream of Monkey, on Monkey Mountain and you know, Pantomime. All of these plays are stunning examinations of race, identity, memory, the African past and its present in the Caribbean society and culture. And part of it is that you see that his line of theatrical understanding it goes back to something like Peter Brooks's, you know, the, the, you know, the holy theater. Um, and he, he understands theater as ritual, right? And it shows you the difference between these two genres, right? Where poetry is reflective and, and theater is, is interactive. It's about the conversation with the community, with people in the audience. Um, and his poetry changes in that way. It becomes far more ritualized and, and about 
articulating out, sort of speaking out and looking for a response back. So it's a great thing to study because I think Walcott demonstrates these two sides of, of, of you, can't, you can't say you've read Walcott unless you've read both his plays and his poems because they are in deep conversation with each other. Um, so yeah, no, Walcott is, uh, you know, just remarkable. So, so, so I think that's his, and his theatrical interest, he's not from the, you know, the Stanislavski school, you know, that's not Walker. Walker is, he skips that bunch and goes straight to the, the ritual, right? To, the, to, the, to that space uh, where song, body, all of these things begin to work. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Thank you. you're welcome, yeah, yeah. One at a time, because I can't, I can't, yeah. <laughs> How did you choose Poseidon for the cover of the book, or did you? <laughs> um, <laughs> Matthew, you want to take that? <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a conversation, shall we say. Um, obviously, this was not my choice for the cover, uh, but I was convinced by the marketing people who said, this is the one, right? Um, but there are so many choices with Bearden. My idea was to pick something that, um, and we've done it here, something that is not overused, that's one thing, but something that is representative. And, and I think there's a way in which this demonstrates this, this reversion that Walcott is involved in, revision, reversion of the Odyssey and sort of writing it in, in sort of exploring the black experience in it. So, so, so I think that's, that's part of what justifies it and that, that's a, but as, as a choice for me, I would have had um, a different choice, yeah. Um, I was, which one was it? I was interested in the, it wasn't the return, but it was, it was um, it's that scene where there's a battle, right? And there's a battle between Od um, Odysseus and um, I think it's, it's, this, this, it's a battle scene and it's great mountains in the background and so on. I just, I love that. I love the green, I love the sea and so on. So, but, yeah. That wasn't the, the Camel, the Sun God. That wasn't that one. No, no, it wasn't that one. Which is a good one too. That's a beautiful one. That's a beautiful one, yeah. But you can't go wrong with Bearden. I mean, that's the truth. We had actually, Kwame and I had agreed. Yeah. So you learn in life that you take on certain battles and, and, you, and you win some and you lose you some. And, some. And, and we, we lost this battle with our editor. Yeah. Um, but you know, the book came out beautifully. We, we preferred a different cover and they, they I, I, will, I will give them credit. They spent a lot of energy trying to change our minds. I don't think they, <laughs> I don't think they did it, but, um, but, but yeah. it's a beautiful book. No, yeah, no, so, so we, we, like we had actually agreed to a, slightly different cover, but I think this is a really striking image and, yeah. and you know, yeah, the marketing people. Yeah. We were so happy to collaborate with our education. And I was interested in knowing, uh, Karen, uh, you are working with students who are working with um, lesson plans that uh, are for children, younger people. Um, why do you feel that uh, Bearden is so appropriate for younger children? Uh, well, it's really limited to the adult. Could you stand up and 
I think Honoré's poem that Matthew read, it's a very interesting, it's a very sort of lyric experience that she's exploring. And so what always interested me about reading some of these poems is where, where does Bearden walk in? Sometimes Bearden is sitting at the front and they're saying this poem is, uh, you know, Elizabeth Alexander says Bearden at work, right? So that, that's pretty clear. But then at other poems you start to ask where, where is the poet engaging? Where is this moment? In Abani's poem that I read, this idea of death that ends with the sea is where it appears. And then suddenly you start making those connections. The other thing that kept striking me in these poems is the blue, the idea of blue, how blue appears in all of these poems in these wonderful punning ways of the blues, the blue, the blue, you know, all of these elements of blue, blue as open. And then, of course, you, it pulls you back to, to, to Bearden's work and to pay attention. Because, of course, the interesting thing about Bearden's work is the collage is a fascinating form because the collage is a conscious choice of each piece that you layer. And, and that's, that's a fairly fragmented way of engaging um, representation. You're sort of breaking representation and then rebuilding representation. And for poets, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we're pulling from all over and we are creating these juxtapositions. And in many ways, some of the poems are merely a, a conversation about collaging, right? And so that the images jump and jump and jump. And what they're doing is reproducing that. So there's a lot to be talked about in terms of what these poets are doing, how they're engaging with the art, how they're reproducing the process of the art, how they're following narrative, how they're breaking narrative, how they're taking characters in, this, in the painting and choosing this voice. I'm going to pick this woman and I'm going to be in her voice. There's tremendous, all the possibilities of ekphrasis are sort of are represented here. And, and for me, that's, that's been one of the exciting things. It's very teachable. You know, if, you, if you're a teacher and that's what you want to teach, it's, it's perfect for that. It's, it's, it's almost like a, an exercise in, um, in, in following the clue and saying, oh, that's, and then, then you understand allusion, then you understand the dialogue, then you understand all these kind of imaginative exercises in, in their art, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, similarly, I, one of the great things is the myriad approaches that people took in responding to the work. So in any of the poems where the poet mentions a specific piece, it brought me back. But I think the piece that stands out in my mind, which we didn't read, there's an incredible poem by Ed Roberson yeah. in, in the book where he, he made me go back and look at all of Bearden's work because he, he took a much kind of broader approach thinking of Bearden in a very aesthetic way. And so he, he made me actually return not just to this series, but to a whole bunch of Bearden's work and, and look at it differently. He plays a lot with, with the images of, of masks in his piece, um, in, in Ed's piece. And so that, that made me kind of go back and see Bearden's work as these interesting series of masks. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 a lot of my poetry, more than I even admit to, is responding to art. And I don't reference, I don't say, you know. So a lot of the poems I write, I, I'm responding to art. I write in art books, that's, that's one of my things. So I have piles of art books. They have to have a lot of white space. So I don't want all them words of people analyze, I don't want to read that. I just want art, blank space, and I write my poems on them. Um, Part of, the, part of that engagement for me is, uh, is it, it feels like a, okay, look. So one of the things about me is that I, I don't feel that working hard unnecessarily is necessary. Um, so, so, which is why I get a lot of stuff done because like, you know, it's a, so that's hard. Okay, that's easier. Well, duh, that's the path. I mean, as, I mean, as long, <laughs> as long as I'm getting it done, I mean, I'm, I'm, why, why, why sweat it, right? That's my thing. And, and writing ekphrasis is like the greatest cheat in the world because it's so cool. The artist has done all the work, got the images together. And, you know, if you want to write like a surreal poem, find a surreal artist and just describe what is there. And people go, whoa, that's amazing. Like, how did you think of that? And blah, blah, blah. And it works. Like, it's just there. It's like, you just rip it off and just don't mention it. Like, and there you got this poem. <laughs> but, but, 
but it's an exercise in, in this conversation. And what I try to describe in the various ways these guys do it is part of what I do. There's, there's a great story, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but um, Proust, Marcel Proust, the um, French, um, the French uh, uh, novelist, describes, he says, I don't, you know, he says in the, that self-deprecating way that some French people have, only some, um, of, I, I know nothing about art, I know nothing, absolutely nothing about art, and so on, and all I do is when I look at a painting, I look for my family in the painting. Well, it's cute, it's a cute idea, but it's rich with, with this idea that you find your space in the art. You look in the art and you find your emotional moment in the art. And I, I, I find that really appealing for, for a poet writing in response to art. It, you, you don't have to do the work of Musée de Beaux-Arts, which is sort of saying, which is saying, I'm doing a piece about a painting, and it's doing that thing, um, the Arden poem. But you sometimes are just picking a moment, picking a corner, picking a detail, and conversing with that detail and letting it trigger something. Um, and I, I love that, those possibilities. And I love the possibilities of how different styles of art that you might not think you write a certain kind of poetry, but if you look at art in that mode and in that, in that genre, that period of art, um, you find yourself learning exactly what it means to do surrealism. It, you, you find yourself learning about experimentation, all kinds of things you learn by seeing how it works in art and then sort of replicating it um, in poetry. So that conversation to me is, is rich with possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, we are